Today we're in the city of Jerusalem and we're going to be exploring some of the past in order to try and understand a little bit about the future. I get to go to an archeological site and we're going to be talking to some really great people. That's next on First Century Foundations. Welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm standing between the old city of Jerusalem and the new city of Jerusalem, right here at the intersection. I love coming to Israel because this is such a reality here. Everywhere you go, the old bumps up against the new, and, and here in Jerusalem, it's no different. We're gonna be visiting today uh, an amazing site called the City of David, and it's where they have discovered the ancient Jebusite city, the original old city, of Jerusalem. And so we want to invite you along on our journey. We're going to be standing in some very, very cool places. Uh, maybe possibly the place where Abraham and Melchizedek met for that very first time back in Genesis chapter 14. It's almost 4,000 years of history. It's an amazing, amazing feeling to be able to participate in that. And so we want you to come along with us on that journey. Also today, we're going to visit with Chad Holland in the new city. Chad is the lead pastor of King of Kings community, a vibrant church here in Jerusalem that is reaching out to all kinds of people in need and people who need to know the truth about uh, Messiah, Yeshua. And so stay with us. We'll be back with the city of David and later with Chad Holland in just a moment. Stay tuned, coming up after the break, Jeff visits the ancient ruins of the city of David. First Century Foundations is continuing to bless the land of Israel. And this is all possible because of people like you. With your help, we have been able to support local ministries within Israel who are caring for some of the nation's most needy by providing food and clothing for the poor and much more. The House of Light is one such ministry that not only ministers in prisons, but also runs a summer camp for children. We're in the middle of this camp and uh, all the noise of the children around us, rejoicing uh, in the Lord and in your health, and we just want to say thank you. This is all possible because of your prayers and support. Call or write today and become a monthly partner for just $30 a month or more. And be sure to ask for your free Israel Prayer Watch so you can be up to date on all that is happening with these ministries in the Holy Land. We are waiting to hear from you. Well, welcome to the City of David. We're here with Anarina. You're gonna be our guide and our host today. And um, we're standing kind of in a very unique place right now with a great perspective. So tell us about where we are. What was the great discovery that sort of helped to bring all this to light? And uh, what do we learn from where we're standing right here? Jeff, welcome to the city of David, to the viewers Thank as well. You. As you say, a very important place. In my opinion, the most important place, not because I think so, because the Bible says so. So let's figure out where we are. Up till 150 years ago, everybody thought that the ancient biblical Jerusalem that you read in the, in the Bible lies within the confines of the old city that you see behind us. Right. Now, the question is what happened 150 years ago and where is the ancient biblical Jerusalem? To appreciate that, we have to understand um, the time period that we're talking about. We're talking about 2,000 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, right. where nothing happened. There was nothing here. So the ancient city slowly disappeared. She was covered by civilizations of time. And um, so 150 years ago, Queen Victoria wakes up one morning and she wants to know what's happening in Jerusalem. The only thing that she knows is the old city. Okay. So she sends a guy with the name Charles Warren to come and figure out what's going on. He comes here during the Ottoman period. Um, the Ottomans told him, 
no way that you're going to get in here. So he gets redirected. Right. Same thing that happens with us in our lives when uh, sometimes you believe that this is God, what God wants for you. You see the goal, you're going for it. And the moment when you are at the point where you can touch it, boom, he redirects you to something <laughs> completely different. Uh -huh. Now, this was very important because right. for God, this was important that this whole city had to be rediscovered because she needs to wake up for the end of days yeah. of the things that we about to see and what we're seeing already. We are seeing prophecy fulfillment every day in the city of David. Shake off your dust, arise, take your rightful place, O Jerusalem. And it also says, the city will be built again exactly on its place. Wow. So for all of that uh, that had to happen, somebody had to rediscover her. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened 150 years ago. So as we, as we look around us, what all are we seeing? I mean, you you referred to the old city that's here. Correct. We know that the city of David that, that Charles Warren, one of the first archaeologists, discovered over here to our left. And uh, give us the rest of the perspective. Okay, so let's just see what we're looking at when we look at the old city. We see Temple Mount. So the only thing of ancient biblical Jerusalem that is within the confines of the old city is Temple Mount. Is the temple Everything Mount. else lies within this sort of island that we have here because we have the Kidron Valley, as you can see here on my right, to the east and to the west. Um, going up to the Dung Gate, we have another valley called the Tyropian Valley. And between those two valleys, the city of David um, lies enclosed between those valleys. That is what made it so difficult for people to take the city. Right. It was one of the last cities that was taken during the 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 300 year conquest of joshua mm. it was so difficult to take that the jebusite king said no way that you're going to get in here i will put the blind and the lames on these very walls that you can't get in but we know the story further we will go a little bit into that and see how david actually then took the city right. but let's talk about a little bit about the the uh, valley over here the kidron um we will discuss it a little bit later as well, but this is the valley that was called in the times of Abram, Emek Shaveh, the Valley of Equality. And he met with somebody here. He met with... Melchizedek. Exactly. Yes. So this is the valley, exact valley where they met and we will uh, uh, discover a little bit more of that story. All right, great. So where are we heading after this? I think let's go and figure out how we rediscovered the city and also how the city was taken in the first place when David came to conquer the city. Let's go. Okay, let's go and lead the see. way. <laughs> to start our journey into the ancient city of David, Honorina led me to a very dark cave that is actually beneath the excavation of the city ruins. We are underground today in the city of David. And uh, Anarina, tell us, what am I seeing here? What, what, are we, what are we learning about? Jeff, we're standing in a place where history was made twice already. And what you see here is the Warren shaft. This is where Warren came up through this natural feature. And he saw this massive cavity here. And he realized, that, listen, this tunnel is some kind of protective system over the Gihon Spring. Yes. And he realized, but this might just be the ancient biblical Jerusalem. Because he wanted to find it in the old city. And the Ottomans, the Ottomans stopped him and said, you can't get in here. And he found this tunnel. But when we saw this, we also realized, but wait a minute, this is the place probable, the most probable place yeah. where the story of David taking the city took place. Why do we say that? In the Bible, we don't read anything about how David took the city. Hmm. He did it with a reason. He didn't want to tell people how he took the city because then people will read it and the next king will come and take the city. But he did give some kind of hint. He said, he who touches the pipe will take the city and this man will become the head of my armies. So obviously whatever this pipe was yeah. and whoever this guy was, he must have been something. Yeah. And when you look down here, you can see how he had to scale up this wall and go through. And, and it was almost an impossible feat. So impossible that the genocide king said to him, there's no way that you're going to take this city. I will even put the blind and the lame on the walls to mock you. What the Jebusite yeah. king didn't understand that in a favorable time when God chose it, chooses the king that he wants, yeah. everything works the way that God wants. So That's Joab right. came, he came, he scaled through this um, cavity that you see here. So he, jo Joab came right 
through here. Exactly. Now imagine um, That's amazing. what kind of guy <laughs> he must have been to scale through these, wow. uh, this, this cavity here. So he came up here, he had to run all the way through there and he had to open up the gates with David's army to, to take the city. So it must have been, I mean, not easy, but, but certainly it would have helped Joab to, to climb up here and, and go through these tunnels with all of these nice lights here and the stairs and everything. That, that would have worked well for him, right? Would have, if he had that, but we're talking about 3,000 years ago. Right. So obviously this tunnel existed, <laughs> but they probably had some kind of wooden structure here. And the lights that they would have had here, we have it very romantically lit here um, for people <laughs> to feel the adventure. Yes. But you will see um, even there, inside the rock, they, okay. they, they hollowed out where they would put the, the, the candles, the candles. To, to light up this tunnel. This tunnel was actually there only for the times of war because when war came they had to protect the water source take the water take the town take the That's city right. yeah. so he probably had it a little bit harder than what we have today we have today <laughs> we just make it a pleasant experience for everybody to come and visit us here <laughs> that's kind of what we figured yeah good continuing on we passed so much history on arena led me to a place that isn't exactly on the regular tour Okay, guys, we are in a place where the tourists don't get to come. And this is a very special place. We believe that this could be the place that Abraham met Melchizedek, correct? correct? Wow. So uh, tell us, why do we think that? Chef, we're standing at the bedrock of the Kidron Valley. It's closed now because we closed it off to protect the, the excavations, the site, but this yeah. was open air. Okay. So we are standing at the foot of these massive towers that we just saw when we came from the top. Now, if a king from those times, we're talking between 3,000, 4,000 years, um, this was already here, this is Canaanite. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to meet people um, outside the city, it would pro probably would have been here because you can protect him. If anything happens, then he can get back into the tower and He's they can protect the, him. Okay. So in those days, this valley was called the Valley of Shaveh, of equality. And we know that Jerusalem equals everybody else. There's no rich, no poor. Anybody mm. comes here, stands equally before God. And wow. what happened with Melchizedek? What happened with um, Abram? Firstly, he was the king of? Salem. Salem. But now we are in Israel, so we have to speak Hebrew. Too. So he was the king of Shalem. Shalem. And Shalem actually sounds like which word that everybody knows when you Shalom. go? Shalom. There we go. Yes. Now, most people think that Shalom means peace. It doesn't really. It's a very, very um, surface level meaning of that. Mm -hmm. Shalom actually means to be whole to be complete on the deepest part of your soul. It means that where all the paradoxes come together in complete harmony. So if I That's wish great. you shalom, I wish for you to be exactly what God made you to be so that you can also see anybody else that way. Mm. And now wow. we are waiting for that time when Jerusalem is the place where this will be seen, where this peace will come from, but it will be a spontaneous peace because the moment when we can be at that level, Peace will reign spontaneously. And that was Melchizedek. He came from this place. They did two things, very important two things uh, between the two of them. Yeah. First, they broke bread together and they drank wine. The yes. first time that we hear about that. Yeah. The second thing was that Abram paid a tithe to Jerusalem. It's the first time that we hear that through the Father, through all nations who uh, will be blessed, mm -hmm. paid this tithe to Jerusalem. Yeah. And this set a certain setting for what we do today through uh, drinking wine together and breaking bread on Shabbat um, and also when we see the tithe being paid uh, to the poor and taking yeah. care of the Levites, etc. Yeah. etc. Wow, this is incredible. Thank you so much for bringing us down here and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later in the show, so uh, make sure that you stay with us. After the break, Jeff returns to visit Chad Holland, the pastor of the King of Kings Church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the holy city, is the focus of much of the world's attention. And Psalm 122 tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yet do we really know why or even how? Why does God want us to specifically pray for the peace of this ancient city? And how do you pray for a city 
that for most of us seems so foreign and so far away. Praying for the Peace of Jerusalem, the new book by Jeff Uters now reveals God's purpose for the holy city and all of Israel and why he wants every believer to pray for his holy land. Now more than ever, the people of Israel need our prayers and support. And when you order your copy of the book Praying for the Peace of Jerusalem for just $10 plus shipping and handling, you are also helping these precious people in a very real way. Call the number on your screen now or go online to firstcenturyfoundations.com and order Praying for the Peace of Jerusalem and begin to pray for Israel with understanding and purpose. Well, welcome back. I'm here today at King of Kings with Chad Holland. Yes, sir. And Chad, you are, I think it's still recent enough, we can call you the new guy. It's been about, what, a year and a half? Two yeah, years? two years now. Almost yeah. two years? Yeah. Great. Well, we talked with Wayne on a previous show, talked about sort of how King of Kings came into being and, and so on. But, but you're here and you're leading into the future. So tell me, first of all, who is Chad Holland? Where'd mm. you come from? How'd you get here? Praise God. Um, who am I? Well, uh, I have a unique story. I'll try to do it quickly. Yeah. Um, born of two Gentile parents, but adopted by a Jewish father. So my introduction into the Messianic Jewish world um, was through my adopted father. We grew up in synagogue. I went to a Jewish school uh, where we were in Hebrew classes. So I, I grew up in Jewish space when I became a leader. I first became a leader in okay. a Messianic Jewish setting. All so right. I married into a Jewish family. Over time, the Lord called us to make Aliyah to come and be citizens here in Israel. So I married uh, three kids, about to have our fourth. Congratulations. And, uh, we were honored to have the call to come and work with uh, not just King of Kings community, but the whole King of Kings family. Yeah, yeah. So now, you know, leadership transition, that's always, a, it's always an interesting animal. Uh, as you know, I'm doing something similar right sure, now at First right. Century Foundations. And, uh, you know, following someone who's had a long history in a ministry. Talk to me about how that's been going with you and Wayne and, uh, you know, what's, what's the deal? What's gracious of the Lord is this is my third time to uh, transition after a founder. Ah, okay. So this time it was a lot easier than before. Uh, I don't have a lot of secrets other than to simply say this. Uh, I, I feel that it's my... Uh, joyful duty mm. to honor the founders, in this case, Wayne, Amen. as at every turn possible. And then Wayne, to his great credit, is so humble and such a team player and kingdom builder that I feel nothing but honor coming back in my direction. Yeah. So we typically flow in a mutual deference kind of a teamwork, Good. whether it's on the network level or whether it's in the congregational level as pastors and elders. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't be on a better team. And uh, if you're building a team, you want Wayne on your team. So for us, it's been smooth, it's been easy. Uh, there's a lot of honor and trust. Uh, we try to build a high trust culture at King of Kings. Mm -hmm. And because that culture was already established, I think it made it pretty easy to step in. You, d you didn't just take something over. You're not just sort of tending to something that was already created. You're building here a, a great family of ministries. Talk to us a little bit about some of what's new, sure. some of what you're excited about. Yeah, so in the last couple of years, we've, we've doubled in size. Now, what wow. does that mean? Well, King of Kings is a, is a network family of ministries. Mm -hmm. uh, we plant and adopt congregations. We establish training centers and humanitarian aid centers. Uh, we have marketplace ministries, and we plant heritage ministries, things that we don't run the daily operations of anymore, but we right. were in, uh, in the pioneering stage, we were very instrumental. Okay. Altogether, there's 35 to 40 ministries connected Inside the King of Kings network, I have the privilege of serving as the CEO. Yes. I help oversee all the ministries, make sure things are running well, make sure uh, all the leaders, pastors, and directors are well-resourced. My other hat that I get a, uh, the privilege of wearing is I get to be the senior pastor of King of Kings Community Jerusalem. Uh, we've planted several new congregations this year, some here in Jerusalem, some uh, in Herzliya, some in Tel Aviv. Right. So we're excited what God is doing. And even some of the ministries that existed prior like the Yuval School of Music, uh, have, have now expanded to multiple city campuses as well. Tremendous. The Israel Academy of Ministry started yeah. with the Jerusalem campus, and this year we planted the German campus. So, so it's, it's both new, new projects, new congregations, new ministries, and it's watching the expansion of existing ministries onto expanded campuses and locations as well. So we're excited and have passion for lots of these things. We're kingdom builders. Yeah. We're people uniters. Uh, we're not into building the King of Kings 
uh, network brand only. That's not what we're about. But uh, we're, we're Kingdom of God builders. And uh, we are open and happy to partner with anyone who has that like-minded vision. And that's why First Century Foundation and King of Kings work so well together. That's why we go so far back together in ministry. And we're looking forward to, to a great future as well. Well, thank you. And we appreciate so much the way that you help us to facilitate you know, the ministry that we do here in the land of Israel with so many different, uh, different ministries around the land. And that just is, is well, it's critical for us. We, uh, we couldn't do what we do without you guys. So thank you. And, and we want to know, you know, how do, we, how do we pray alongside King of Kings? How can we continue to, uh, to be involved and, and to help uh, with the ministry that you're doing here? I think for us right now, the stage of most needed prayer is when you're stewarding a, a new movement or momentum of God, as the Holy Spirit is blowing on different ministry areas and planted ministries, we, we do need significant prayer on our leadership team okay. that is keeping pace with the growth. Uh, what, what may have started with two or three guys can't stay two or three guys once, once the tent pegs are, are grown. Yes. So we have embarked on and prayed many hours on the expansion of our executive team. Okay. Uh, I'm very happy to say that in all of the congregations and the ministries, we are very excited about the eldership teams and the local pastors who are in place and the directors and assistant directors. Our leadership teams across the board are doing wonderfully well. The executive team has now grown to, uh, to include five new advisors. So our prayers are already being answered. But nice for us, you know, how do you keep these, uh, this momentum? You need financial support, you need prayer support, and you, we need to make sure that the leadership infrastructure can yeah. handle the weight to be good stewards and move forward in wisdom. So if there's some prayer topics, that's what we would ask for. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. And, uh, you know, I appreciate very much being able to come and be a part of the community on Sunday when we are in the land. Uh, this is kind of our home church when I'm away from home. And so it's, uh, it's been a joy. I've, I've been able to hear you speak a number of times over the last couple of years. And so you're kind of becoming my pastor. Well, or, uh, you know. In, what in an some exciting small thought. way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's for us. So great to have you on the show today. Thank you, Jeff. And, um, to all of our viewers back at home, continue to pray for King of Kings, for Chad, his leadership. You've heard him share about some of those needs that they need prayer for. And we wanna just ask you to continue to come alongside and uh, make sure if you're not signed up for the Israel Prayer Watch, that you get signed up for that bi-monthly bulletin that will give you lots of ammunition in your prayer time. And we want you to, to be encouraged with that. And then also, if you're ever here in the land of Israel, uh, and you can come with us, we encourage you to do that. But if you're ever here, make sure you visit King of Kings, go to the prayer tower and uh, spend some time. It really is uh, an amazing experience to be here and a part of this community. So thanks for being with us today. Chad, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for your time. And uh, God bless. First Century Foundations has been making a difference in the lives of some of Israel's most needy for years. And you have been a vital part of this important work. Because of your gifts, we have been able to support the believers in the Holy Land, who every day are sharing the love of God with the elderly, Holocaust survivors, refugees, underprivileged children, and everyone in need from all backgrounds and walks of life. This practical approach of feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and visiting the sick is making a real difference in many lives throughout the land of Israel. Call or write today and become a monthly partner for just $30 a month or more and begin to make a real difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. And when you call, be sure to ask for the free Israel Prayer Watch so you will be up to date on all that is happening with the ministries that you are supporting. We're waiting to hear from you. Wow, what an amazing day being at the City of David. So appreciated Honorina and all of her information. Uh, sometimes, you know, I get a little overwhelmed because I'm learning as we go along on this journey as well. And uh, 
we're going to talk a little bit about some of those things that uh, that we discussed. Chad Holland is an amazing guy. He's building an incredible family of ministries on the foundation that was built by Wayne Hills, the King of Kings, and uh, we just appreciate their ministry so much. But let me go back to the story of uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. There's some very, very interesting things about this story. First of all, the fact that, you know, Melchizedek comes, he is the king of Salem, the king of peace, but, you know, of the, the place that would eventually be uh, Jerusalem as well. And then he brings out bread and he brings out wine. I don't know if uh, you pick up on the uh, potential symbolism of that or not, but as you think about bread and wine, this is really the first time that it's kind of mentioned in this combination in scripture. It's not unusual, you know, it would be a, a traditional uh, form of, you know, sustenance in those days. But if you think about it, bread and wine also became significant later on during Pesach, during the Passover celebrations as the Israelites left Egypt. And of course, if you're a Christian like, like I am, you also think about the communion service, the fact that Jesus took those two emblems. He took bread and he took wine and he broke it and gave it to his disciples as a, uh, you know, as a way for them to remember his death. And we do the very same thing right up to this day. Kind of incredible when you think about that. I wanna go back to the verse in Hebrews that talks about Abraham and Melchizedek and we're gonna read it together. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and he blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also it means king of Salem, which means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. You know, there's been a lot of speculation over the years about Melchizedek and his origins. Some have even postulated the idea that perhaps he was a theophany, although there's really not all that much evidence to support that. He was a man. He was the king of Salem at the time. But the, the symbolism around him and the fact that the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament actually draws out the fact that he was someone who resembled the Son of God. Uh, that's significant. And so we see this foreshadowing in the story of Abraham and Melchizedek all the way up to, to the coming of Yeshua, Mashiach, Jesus Christ. I just think it's incredible that we are able to learn these things together as we walk on these ancient stones in the city of David. I'm so glad that you've been able to be with us today. So glad that you could find out more about King of Kings community and Chad Holland, who is the, the new lead pastor at that, that community, that church, that congregation. And so uh, we want you to continue praying. Pray for the ministries here in the land that are reaching out in the current day to touch the hearts and lives of people and lead them to faith in Yeshua Messiah. Thank you so much for your support and God bless you. It's been great to have you with us on the show today. Thank you for watching. To learn more about this program and the ministries in Israel that we help or to receive the Israel Prayer Watch, call the number on the screen or visit us online at firstcenturyfoundations.com. And to keep up to date on all that we're doing, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Join Jeff Futers again in Israel next week on First Century Foundations.